You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host. My mission is to have guests that recall and relate moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my guests. And my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And I do keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And if you can reach me or need to reach me, rather, you can get me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com or david at thatgratitudeguy.com for email. So let me get on with the show and introduce you to my guests. It's always my favorite part of my weekly my weekly enterprise, That Gratitude Guy podcast. And I'm excited for my guest this week. That's no exception. Peter Heyer from Higher Expectations operates differently from other search firms by offering a hiring experience that challenges the status quo of our peers in the industry. Our model is customizable, repeatable, scalable, and rooted in our relationship with you. We will learn the mission, vision, culture, and values of your organization to help you acquire the perfect people for your team. Higher Expectations simplifies the hiring experience and raises the expectations for both the clients and candidates. With more than 25 years of experience and expertise in talent acquisition, This search firm focuses on the software slash technology space. And on a personal note, Peter is a native of Denver, Colorado. His ancestors, this is so cool, built the state capital. He is happily married to Tricia for the last five and a half years. They have lived in Highlands Ranch, just south of Denver with two boys and has two grown children that are out of the house. He loves baseball, theater, hiking, biking, and skiing. He sings in the church choir and volunteers for a men's ministry. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Wow. Let's do this every week because I love that intro. That's good stuff. Uh, oh, it's always people always have something tricky to say. Who wrote that? Oh, I wrote that. How did you find that? It's like, I, I sound good. Are you sure you have the right guest on the show? Yeah. So, um, but I, I do always start with the same question just to establish a context. Tell the listeners and viewers uh, how you and I met. Um, David, you and I met through a LinkedIn group that we are in, and uh, we share we share valuable tips and tricks of our experience, and that's how we connected. Was more of a referral basis, so that's a um, a group that we belong to where we we seek insight and um, and then we we wanted to chat with one another. We wanted to get to know each other as opposed to just being a social media connection. We were somewhat intentional. And so Absolutely. we said, yeah, let's talk and figure out what who who's the face behind the, you know, social media. So that's how exactly. we connected. Exactly. And it's really neat. I say this uh, every so often. I never mention it if it's somebody that I don't connect with for obvious reason. But I remember when I first met you, I thought, oh, I got to talk to this guy. This guy just seems cool. I, I got to, I don't even know where he lives in the country or whatever, but with all this Zoom and everything. And it's just the neatest thing when you meet people. And I've always said it, and I say it on every other podcast or so. After about 30 seconds, you decide what you think of the person. And nine times out of 10, you're right. I mean, a year later, you, you know, from the very beginning, I always liked that guy from the beginning. And then there's those occasional, didn't care for him, didn't really want to follow through, didn't like, so there's going to be that. So let's, let's thank you for answering that. Let's back up. And you've had several careers and quite an interesting history uh, throughout the course of your life as you and I've gotten to know each other, but yeah. kind of tell the listeners, start with a little bit, maybe the after college into the business world and talk about some of the first of your endeavors. Well, I've, um, so I went to school thinking I was going to be an actor and a singer and an entertainer because mm. that just really resonated with me. And then I realized I got to get a job because I got to pay the bills. <laughs> And what am I good at? And so that's kind of how I got into recruiting was, um, you know, I started working here in Denver 
uh, way back when, a hundred years ago, when I started working, you know, there was oil busts all over all the time. And so I ended up work, starting with the state. Mm. And my skill set gave me a gift of gab and a gift of helping, wanting to help. I mean, I've always had this sense of wanting to be of service. So that's how I cut my teeth in recruiting was I went to work with the state department of labor. And then I got introduced to the department of economic development where new companies are coming into Denver and I'd help them fill their positions. That's how I kind of cut my teeth. Mm. And so throughout the rest of my career, just getting more education and, and knowing the internet, you know, we used to recruit before the internet. And so, and it's, it's exactly, David, what you started this conversation with. The reason you and I uh, wanted to connect was because we wanted to get to know one another. It's something behind, who is this person? What motivates them? Why are they doing what they're doing? Right. And as the, you know, and I use these techniques on a daily basis, and I don't know whether employers do. <laughs> so my my role is to just plain and simply help employers try and get out of their way. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And I think also you just mentioned something about um, uh, wanting to be an actor and and that was gonna, it wasn't going to pay the bills. And then the gift of gab. I always think it's interesting because for some reason the gift of gab. I guess it sounds positive, but there's people have said to me a lot over my life. You sure talk a lot, and you talk fast, and you and I always think, man, I guess. I guess moderation is the key, but if I had a choice, I'd rather talk too much and talk too fast and not talk at all. Because we've all met people that every other word, every other question is a one word answer and you just don't get anywhere with them. They don't offer anything and it's just a very limiting type conversation. But so you had that from that ability to communicate from a young age, correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and I found that um, sometimes people thought I was funny. Mm -hmm. And so that that bit of humor and not everyone is extroverted. That's just what I do. I love being in a group setting and um, I love to sort of entertain or put people at ease to make them feel comfortable. And, and what I'm finding is I get more mature, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that we um, my listening skills are mm -hmm. going. It's it's. I'm trying to graduate from the, let's just talk about me the whole time to, I want to hear more about you. So that way, if I have some input or thoughts or suggestions, not necessarily advice, but I'm getting to be better at listening mm -hmm. because if you're an introvert, the last thing you want to do is talk. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I always want to make you feel comfortable. So I'll just talk, 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 talk over you. And I, I think that's a good point because I noticed sometimes in defense of yours and my personality, I would sit there and I would wait for five or 10 or 15 seconds for somebody to say something. And I thought, well, if they're not going to say anything, I'm going to start talking. I'm going to ask more questions or, or bring up more subjects. We're not just going to sit here and look at each wow. other like at a, you know, a cocktail party or something yeah. like that. And, you know, some people, I think there's a time for silence, but when you're meeting somebody, it's like, well, we're just going to sit and stare at each other. So I just think it's so interesting because there's so many cool things to learn about people. And I know that uh, I'm from Seattle and two of the more, well, two of the richest people in the world live here, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. In fact, they live on the same street about a mile apart. And uh, I remember reading about Bill Gates Sr. And so he was asked many times about Bill Gates Jr., who started Microsoft. And they said the biggest thing he noted about him is he had an absolutely insatiable curiosity. He yeah. was always asking questions, always digging into this, finding that research and everything. And I think I've said many times there's two types of people. There's a lifelong learner and then there's know-it-alls. And we all know know-it-alls. And, and they just it's just so boring. And you think about what you found out. And, and actually, that's a kind of a good segue into higher expectations. I don't want to get into that this early, but just now that I think about it, what has made you good at what you've done beyond the listening and doing this ability to get out and, and help recruit people for companies? Uh, well, it's one of the questions, David, that I ask anybody, and, and I've been kind of Zooming before it was popular, mm -hmm. <laughs> or mm -hmm. pre-COVID anyway. Yeah. Um, David, I think for me, at, at the end of the day, my motivation is service. Mm. 
it's being of service. And so I've been with enough large organizations to see how they handle the most important duty a company has is to be of service to their number one asset, which is their people. Yep. There is not a fully automated company that does everything by robots yet. Right. And so we need humans. And what I noticed at all the large companies is everyone was a cog in the wheel. Let's get another one. Just get another one. Get another one. Get another one. And there was no human interaction. There was nothing. And so how that helped me was was I quite honestly felt like I, I had gotten some sort of divine intervention, some sort of a call that said, there's got to be something you can do, Peter, to make this a different exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it make the company feel like this portion of their company is important, bringing in the number one asset any company has is their people. Right. So that should be the number one thing a company does. And the other part is treating a human like a human. Yeah. Instead of a, you're number 57, go sit down and start developing, you know, software. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how, that's, that's kind of what I felt and I still feel today. There's nothing more important than getting on and talking about what's going on in a person's life. Mm -hmm. Just because a CEO has a million dollars doesn't mean you know what's going on before he got on the screen. Correct. And finding out what happened to that candidate on their way to the interview, you don't know what happened. Why were they, you know, so it's diving a little deeper than just the cursory, tell me about your skill set. It's, uh, shall I say, David, without being too cliche, it's, it's caring. Yeah. Yeah, which is funny because that's not always an attribute that I demonstrate for people that know me really well. I think they know that I care, but it's also caring less about me and more about somebody else. So right, right. It, it's being developed on a daily basis. And you know what's interesting? I, I picture you once I got to know you and knew what you did and everything, I picture you talking to these people and finding these people like a, a headhunter firm or what have you for the companies yeah. and so on, but a much or more kind of a boutique version of that. Right. And one of the things I never understand is like, for instance, you talked about listening. Uh, my motivation is service. My listening skills are increasing. And so I'm asking you the question. So I don't expect that you're going to be taking notes, but I'm taking a lot of notes and I've never understood how people can say, well, if they're interviewing something, they're a good listener, how they do it without taking notes. I just, I've, I'm fascinated by that because if you're going to listen, now I want to come back to, you said that my motivation is service and the number one asset is their people. And I think as I look at that and make that note, I think about companies that said their number one thing was their customer. It's wrong. Their number one thing is their people. <laughs> Without people, they're going to have no customers and stuff. So, but how does higher expectations beyond what you just said kind of distinguish itself versus some of those other run of the mill recruiters? Um, well, it's, it's a, uh, gosh, David, what a great question. I want to articulate this. Um, it's having a foundation, knowing, mm. why, knowing why we're here to serve. Mm. And so, you know, that's, that's you know, I, I serve. I'm not the CEO, really. That's God. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my CEO. And then I, um, what separates us? Um, well, there's a great deal of experience in dealing with large and small companies and large, you know, so it's, it's more than 25 years of talking to human beings. Wow. So that separates um, the marketplace, the IT marketplace and understanding where it's going and artificial intelligence and all of these fun little buzzwords you hear, um, at the end of the day, it's still a human being. Yeah, I yeah. could probably teach you and your company could probably teach you how to do the software development, mm -hmm. but they can't teach you motivation. Right. They can't teach you how to treat another person. Why are we creating this automation is to make David's life better. Yeah. And so, um, for me, what separates higher expectations is, 
um, experience, empathy, caring, and we're just really good at it. <laughs> and, that's, and that's good. And that's good. Well, and the results will speak to that, of course, too. Yeah. You know, and I think there was years ago, I, it's probably now 30 or 40 years ago, it was in the 80s or 90s, but I read a survey and it said, what do people want in a job? And at the time, number three was being in on the no, we came in at number three. Number two was help with personal problems. And number one was appreciation and recognition. And so then they did the same survey, similar group uh, a couple of years ago in the early or mid 2020s or 2010s rather. And they had number three, they still said appreciation recognition was still part of it. But the new survey said number three was responsibilities. Number two was uh, goals. And number one was purpose. And, yeah. and I think when you talk about serving God and what we're doing, and this is, I'm of service and I'm helping people. And uh, my motivation is of service. And you think about helping people. And I always think one of the best, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, and I'm fortunate enough in my work to hear this, that somebody starts a sentence with Peter, I'll never forget when you said blank. You're the only person that ever took the time that, that <laughs> such and such. You're the person that taught me blank. Any sentence that starts like that, you cannot put a price on that. Yeah. It's just incredible. And I'm sure you hear that a lot. That it's so funny. You, it isn't funny. It's, it's, it's life that you said that I just got off a phone call where, you know, if, if anyone's having a bad day, you're sitting here saying, what am I doing? I'm not designed to do this. I'm horrible. I stink at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, David, before we got on, on this call, I just talked to an individual and we talked about why he's doing what he's doing. And it's, he's busting his tail to take care of his son. Oh, wow. And that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. If I can help him, then guess who wins? Yeah. If I can help this guy, then I've got another uh, individual I've helped who was able to go and, and help out his entire community in the Philippines. Because mm. I was able to help him get a job. Wow. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the benefits of, of doing what I'm doing is to impact two people, to get a company that may not get it, and to help an individual that is trying to get it and just wants to be of service. Because that will never stop. Those questions you mentioned, David, that the whole thing about the talent issues in America today People wouldn't leave your company if you treated them well, if yeah. you listened to them well, right, if true. you made them feel as though they were valuable and had something to say, if they knew that there was a future in there for them. Exactly. Any of these issues, you don't have to, you don't, you don't need me because you don't got to go hire people. Yeah. But otherwise, what's your value proposition? Why does David want to come work at your company? What's the exactly. story? Exactly. Oh, 10,000 more. No, oh, okay. Well, it's instructive too that people leave people; they don't leave companies. You and, know? and so then you wonder, what about that kind of boss or that management staff or whoever it might be that treats? I've had a couple of situations in my life where I was just treated horribly, and decent, actually, one very, very high level company. And I thought, how can this be? But it was the person directly in front of me, my boss, that made me yeah. want to leave and so forth. So, how you understand that motivation? And one of the things I know the millennials get maligned for a lot of things, but I've got to give them a lot of credit for some of these things. We don't need to own a car as much, and we can take Uber and different things, and we don't always have to buy a home and that they've had a, a lot of different ways of looking at than maybe any other generation prior to this. But I, I think one of the things that's interesting is they're giving up a lot of the money more for purpose. And like somebody said, a bunch of people went to work for Wikipedia, which is free. You don't get paid, but just to have the ability to add to all these stories of this yeah. sort of encyclopedia of the world, if you will. And so it's neat to see how the motivation has changed. And I remember hearing from people in a bank, we'll either give you, like you just said, the $10,000 more or the AVP title, which would you like? Well, you know, the, the AVP title isn't going to help pay your mortgage, but I guess if that's cool for you. So, yeah. but you must see that. How are the, how are the people changing in this day and age from you, your viewpoint? Cause you have such a unique view of that, of what they're kind of looking for now versus 20 or 25 years ago. Um, David, it's um, that the different generations, the, the baby boomers, you know, are all about work ethic. Mm -hmm. The next generation is all about social. 
social injustice. I want to make a difference. This is why I want to do this. And, and not that we're in a complete gig economy, but um, work is not the number one priority for most people. Yeah. It's work-life balance. Look, I'm, I'm going to go work. And now, obviously, remote is, um, for anybody who's out there, remote's here to stay. Yeah, it you're is. Gonna mandate, if you're going to mandate, I got to come into the office. Boy, you better have a value proposition of yeah. why that has to happen. Yeah, I love my colleagues, but at the end of the day, I don't need to. Yeah, yeah. And we've all demonstrated that. And there isn't, a, you know, the top 100 technical companies all had the biggest years ever in the middle of a pandemic. Wow. The wow. biggest, most profitable years. And they did it on the backs of all the people busting their tails at home, mm -hmm. their kids, parents, you name it. You know, and, and listening to you say that and the different things you've gone through, talk to me a little bit as I've gotten to know you, and I know this is part of your life, talk to me a little bit about how gratitude, I mean, I'm that gratitude guy, how gratitude has kind of played a role in your life and how well, you look at things. Wow. Uh, I'm so glad you did. Um, it's, it's hard, and, and David, in a business community, most times people don't want to hear about God in a business mm -hmm. community. Right. And, and most times your employers don't want to hear about the hardships you're having in life. Right. Well, um, in my own life, most of it is, is um, self-imposed <laughs> penalties that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with, with um, parents that had an addiction, um, some diagnosed, some not. And then me having a addiction that I didn't know, um, I found myself in, in a whole mess of trouble. Mm -hmm. In jail, um, third DUI. But of course, I didn't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I joke sometimes that, you know, the state of Colorado helped me get sober because they have some very, very intensive programs and one is lockdown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I had a, uh, a jail experience that is written in a, in a book that my wife did. But here, when, when we talk about gratitude, David, it is um, the ability for me to overcome a addiction that I didn't realize I had, that I had to accept. So there's acceptance, there's dealing with a disease, and there's dealing with, you know, why was I fortunate to be able to live through this? Yes. And not continue to self-destruct, to not um, deny, I've got a problem and I, I caused it. And Peter, just to interject there, Again, knowing the story, but this is very important to me. I've known a number of people, quite sadly, that did not live through the experience, and they're no longer here. And, and what do you feel happened with you that somehow you were able to come out on the other side, maybe versus the ones that didn't? Well, um, it's God. It's plain and simply God. I, I mean, I prayed that I thought I may have had a problem, but nobody told me I had a problem. Mm -hmm. And that maybe I ought to stop drinking. And uh, he, he heard my prayer and he put circumstances in my life, never that I would have asked for, but that's what I needed because I'm very stubborn. I'm very hard headed. Mm -hmm. And I have that, you know, uh, the old fashioned never quit. Yeah. If you're going to do something, you do it a hundred percent. Even if that's taken out the trash, you you do it 100%. And, yep. and that's kind of the, the way this company started was it's not my company. But I work no matter whether I get no calls, no business, no whatever. I try and do 100% like I'm working for God. And that's, you know, the part the here's what it is, David. It was a stripping of my ego. Mm that I am not the most important thing that I, that the self-talk I really thought I was as I was Mr. Entertainer and jazz hands and yep. I'm a big deal and I got a company. And, and so 
it's a breaking down, a surrendering of me. Am I willing to surrender that I'm not all that in a bag of chips? Yeah. I'm, and, I'm, and, and I you know, have a problem. And you know what's interesting about that to me, Peter, self-talk. And I think so many people suffer from negative self-talk. And I'll tell people that I never forget names. And I, I remember how to spell it's H-E-Y-E-R. And I pay attention to it and so forth. And people go, I'm terrible with names. And I go, you know, you keep saying that you'll always be terrible with names. If you're, if you're two ears, hear that. But I do think it's a challenge because it's kind of like with the money. You shouldn't spend all your money, but you shouldn't save all your money. You should. You need to live somewhere in between. And so I think back to Peter in grade school and oh. the person that was funny and he was bouncing off the walls again, someone not that dissimilar from mine and so on. But you couldn't win because on the one hand, I'd be making all the jokes and everybody, oh, he thinks he's so cool and, and he's kind of conceited. That was a word I heard quite a bit or he's sure. overly confident. But then there's the other little boy in the corner. Oh, look at little Jimmy. He has no confidence. He sits in the corner. I'm so sad. It's like you couldn't win, you know, and, and so to try to find that, maybe that's that I say the 95 year old people at talks I, I walk into. What's your one bit of advice? Everything in moderation. So maybe it's moderation is the key to that. Well, that would never um, I would just moderate until I still got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part about your your I would be bouncing across the wall until I ended up in the corner. And that's how I ended up getting <laughs> more right. attention for Peter being in the corner for acting up. That's right. It's, David, it was, um, the whole circumstance I went through was a awakening. It's a just a cold, hard look in the mirror saying, you know what? Mm -hmm. You, you, it, it was all ego. It was yeah. all, this is my world and this is the way we're going to do it. And Yes, have I been called arrogant and and uh, aloof? Mm -hmm. And I said aloof. Wow, I didn't think so, but yeah. And so this was. Um, I truly believe, and I don't know if your listeners. I truly believe it was an act of God, and and mm. he answered a prayer, and He delivered me, and and so many of the things that you know. I was not able to provide because of my own woundedness in my first marriage. I now have the ability because I've healed, I'm getting yeah. healthy. And that's what made me available for my new spouse that, um, you know, I, I kind of put off the old Peter and, and put on a new skin and it makes me much more aware. It makes me much more of service to David or to any other person I talk to is because I took a teeny tiny bit of a humility pill and a arrogance pill and a, you know, I am not in charge. <laughs> well, and I think it's neat. You hear things like it takes as long as it takes and uh, everything happens for a reason. I happen to believe that not everybody does, but I look at you and Trisha talk about, you know, with Trisha losing her husband and so forth, talk about timing of the two of you coming together oh, probably wouldn't have worked 25 years ago. There's, there's every, yeah, the timing couldn't have worked. Uh, she couldn't have generated it. I couldn't have figured it out. There was, you know, literally um, just a divine, you know, timing and, and introduction and the whole way we got to meet, but she had to do her healing. Yep. I had to do my healing for us to be, you know, um, not that this is a couples therapy session that you and I are talking about, but but what I have seen in my lifetime is couples just, oh, divorce, oh, let me get together with somebody else, let me get together, like that's going to change it, like your partner right. is the one that's going to change it. Yeah, I took it upon myself to do the hard work, and believe me, this was 10 years of very hard work. Mm-hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it was me surrendering my yeah. ego, my everything, but I, to get healthy, otherwise I wouldn't have been available for Trish. Well, and I think also you said God, which certainly I think is, oh. is going to be your answer because 10 years of hard work, that's not exactly, that's the marathon versus the sprint. And there's a lot of people that give up too easily. There's the, the joke about the average salesman takes four sales calls to make a sale, but the average salesman gets, gets, um, uh, uh, frustrated uh, after two calls and, more, yeah. and won't make any more. So you got for 10 years, that's a long time. And so it, we're, there had to be other things though, as well as your belief in God that kept you going for the 10 years though, knowing that you come out on the other end, right? Well, 
You know what? It's funny because in, in my other programming in AA, we say, you know, it's one day at a time. I'm given today yeah. to yeah. make whatever impact. And I didn't even want to surrender to that program. Wow. Because I've got all of that. So um, a lot of it is God. A lot of it is perseverance. A lot of it is the work ethic that my father, you know, instilled and my mother instilled in me. This is what we do. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, that, that we don't quit. Yeah. So that, and, and believe me, there are days, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. There are days in, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago today where it's like, Oh, what's the use? Exactly. Is, is it ever going to get better? Is anything going to change? And then I forget, I've got an amazing life. (laughs) I've got four children yeah. I'm alive. My health is awesome. And so those speaking of gratitude, sir. Well, and that's something that thank you for bringing that up. Cause that's a perfect segue over to when I talk about the gratitude journal or anything else, it's even when my wife passed away and it was tough going through those when the boys were four and 14 and getting through it. But even back then, I remember I still had my health. I had my two sons. I had a roof over my head. We had food in the yeah. refrigerator. There's always something to be grateful for. And nobody said this life was going to be easy or fair. You know, it's really tough. And, and to your point about those days, what was the old line? Mama said there'd be days like this. There are yeah. going to be days like this. And your goal is back to one day at a time. It's just to get through that day. And most of the time, the next day is better. But if it's not, you have the same goal. Get through that day and the one after that. And just, but I'm always fascinated by perseverance. In fact, that segues in. I've got about five more minutes. I want to make sure I get a couple other questions in. In the business world, if we look at going back, and I know you told me you're doing some photo shoots here a while ago, the acting, the photo shoot type thing, or the recruiting in the state of Colorado and things like that. But what would you, for the person that's starting out and said, Peter, I know you've had some bumps and bruises along the way, but you've been arguably very successful. What would you tell them? Well, here's two or three things that you should think about as you're starting out in your career that might be helpful based on having 30 or 40 years under your belt. Uh, to remember, remember your why. Mm. You hear that a lot, David, but it's remember why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. So true. Um, to put plans together that you can follow through with. Mm. Um, I, I mean, in this whole journey, I mean, sometimes when I look at my plans, they're sometimes very, very invisible. And mm. so if I can, you know, come back to have a plan. I like that. With the plan, because uh, even though you have a plan, it doesn't mean the plan is going to be successful. It means you're going to stick with your plan. Yeah. And then if there's a course correction. <laughs> yeah. God gave me a course correction. I yeah. mean, Peter, you cannot live your life the way you're doing it. And so I'm going to help you. So I think um, empathy, listening, way more listening than talking, which is <laughs> super funny for me to say um true though but it helps me to be able to empathize with my companies or my clients or my customers or my candidates if if i know why there's a gap in your employment oh well you did it because you were taking care of fill in the blank Mm -hmm. yeah a company doesn't see that a company's not going to ask that oh you've got gaps in your employment well, what about the character of that individual that he stayed with the person that really matters? Exactly, exactly. So, so more of that listening and empathizing and understanding people without, without judgment. Yeah, that is, that is so good. And I think it's interesting, too. You mentioned your parents. Uh, I've always, I love the question. Uh, there's a lot of questions of mine that are just favorite ones because they really dig deep. And, and one of them is, is where does your motivation come from? And you mentioned your parents. Uh, I've had people that's their parents. It's a professor. It's a coach. It's a friend. It's something. But I do think when you mentioned your parents around work ethic, I've always said, 
I was born with a one heck of a work ethic, and I know I got it from my father, but I also believe you can't take work ethic 101 at the local school and get an A and then have a work ethic when you pass the final exam. You know, no. you either sort of have it or you don't, and those are just pure blessings, and you and I are very much on the same page with that because it's just, just God's gifts, and, you know, taking advantage of God's gifts is one of the greatest things you can do, in my opinion. Well, amen, David. It's... What is the desire you have when when stuff hits the fan mm -hmm. and you're having one of those days where you've been kicked and slapped and whatever? What's the desire? What yeah, was the exactly. desire when you started? And is that still a desire that you're going to throw away just because the day got hard? Yeah, yeah. And I really like this. And I'm going to, I just want to repeat these again for your tips, which I think are so important. I always like to have the listeners and viewers come away with some tips and remembering your why is so important. I know Simon Sinek's written a, a book oh, a yeah. of books about the why, power of why, which is so important. Uh, put plans together. Number two, put plans together. You can follow. Uh, you mentioned course corrections and I've been a pilot for a lot of years and they, they use the term in flying I've always liked is minor course corrections. You know, if I fly from Seattle to Colorado to see my friend Peter, I'm never going in a straight line. It's just a whole series of zigzags because yeah. you're always correcting for power, for draft, for wind, for, for uh, uh, weather effects and so forth. And so you're always making those minor course corrections. And then empathy, which just as you define empathy, having that ability to feel what somebody else is feeling from their viewpoint and to know what that must be like is so important. And then to your, the, the, port, the fifth point, way more listening and Gosh, I, I, I've become a much better listener, but I could still keep improving on that all the time. There's so much to learn and really be focused on what somebody's saying, which is so important. So those are excellent. Thank you. So let me ask you, and we'll get wrapped up here. My last question is another one of my favorites. And so Peter Heyer at the time, it's say he's the age he is now, and then you were 18, and you only get to pick one thing. Oh. What do you know at this age you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? I'm not in control. Mm. And, and almost section B would be quit trying to cheat the system. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> quit trying. I'm not in control and quit trying to cheat the system. You know, it's just, it's so, those are two very good comments. Thank you so much for those. And I think what did I hear once speaking of quit, uh, cheat the system? Somebody said, you can tell somebody's character by how they do something where they know nobody's watching. Oh, yeah. And I just think that's so great. You know, it's like just anything. And, and yeah, you can try to impress people when nobody's watching. It's just you. Then you can kind of see what somebody's made of. So, well, listen, my friend, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate it. some very, very good sign, uh, good insights there. Remember your why. Put plans together. You can follow course correction, have empathy, and use way more listening. So that is going to wrap it up for this week. Thank you again, Peter. And let me yes, just mention so. for the listeners, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and the Transformation Talk Radio Network. This will actually go out on YouTube as well. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And as I mentioned, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating. If you like what you're here, that's always appreciated. And I do know that people are struggling. So I do offer a gratitude coaching program that will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can compel, propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, then this is the program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is priced at $4,500. And for my podcast listeners, you will receive one extra month free just by mentioning that you heard it on the podcast. So, and as I mentioned, any more information that you would need, you can find me at thatgratitudeguy.com or thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. And oh, and one final thing, a lot of people like to get my Monday morning minute. I send out a 60 minute video every Monday morning at six in the morning to inspire you for the week. And if you'd like to get that, go to your text message and put in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and then you will get signed up for that. So 
Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you wonderful listeners and viewers. And until next time, I'm David George Brook, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.